myself. My name is Jennifer and I am the program director at APDA Northwest. We are a chapter of um, the American Parkinson Disease Association. We cover the five states in the Northwest. Um, and many of you know who are joining us are familiar with the work that APDA does. We really focus on education and programs and services and funding research um, into Parkinson's disease. So this series is part of becoming educated about living with Parkinson's. Um, sleep, as many of you know, can be an issue with Parkinson's and sleep is needed by everyone to recharge our brain, to heal our body, to really help us feel ready to tackle the day. Um, but because trouble sleeping is so common, we really wanted to introduce this topic. So I am pleased that Dr. Kimmy Sue can join us here today. She is a movement disorders neurologist at the Puget Sound uh, Veterans Administration Healthcare System, as well as the University of Washington um, in Seattle. She really is such a great patient advocate, really believes in an interdisciplinary approach to Parkinson's disease. She is actively involved in Parkinson's education and research and in the community outreach programs. She is also now our brand new board medical director um, and is just brings a wealth of knowledge to this topic and to the operations of what we're doing here in the Northwest. So a uh, little bit about today's program. This will be about an hour and it will include some question and answer time. So without further ado, I would love to welcome Dr. Kimmy Sue to the screen. So thank you for the introduction, Jen. So I'm Dr. Kimmy Sue. Um, like Jen said, I am based in Seattle now. I did most of my training in Portland, Oregon for 12 years uh, and then came up to sunny Seattle in 2017, where I did a movement disorder uh, specialty fellowship and then stayed on as faculty up here. Uh, and I've loved my time with APDA working on education. So today we're going to talk about sleep. Uh, so I titled this talk, Not So Sweet Dreams. We're going to talk about sleep and disclaimer to you, I did not get good sleep last night. So I'm very empathetic to the struggles that you may face. I have uh, two kids all under the age of four and a half. And so they kept me up last night. So um, I did have coffee, so I think I'm good. But feel free to ask questions, put in a chat, and then I'll try and get to them. If I can't get to all of them, definitely um, I can write answers back later on. And again, the slides will be a PDF. So don't feel like you have to keep on jotting down notes. You'll get the slides at the end. Um, so just kind of absorb and ask questions, okay? So what we're gonna talk about today, we are going to talk about sleep and why it's important in Parkinson's disease, why it's affected in patients with PD, how it's affected in patients with PD, um, and also talk briefly about fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness. So why is sleep important in PD, Parkinson's disease? So think about when you don't get a good night's sleep, what happens the next day? You don't feel as good. You just don't feel like you move as well. You feel tired and you just don't feel like you think as sharp, sharply. So you have worsened cognition. And unfortunately, you have poor sleep. You might in the daytime feel drowsy and want to take a nap. And then that causes you to have poor sleep that night. And it's a vicious cycle, a cycle that we need to work on breaking. And so we'll talk about this in the, in the rest of the talk. Why is sleep affected in Parkinson's disease? So I bring up this image. Uh, it's what I call the Parkinson's disease iceberg. So on the top surface of the iceberg are the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. You know, the stiffness, slowness, tremors, and posture balance changes. This is what people see. But under the surface, there's many non-motor symptoms that Parkinson's disease patients have. And I write, the different types that patients might face. Not everyone has all these symptoms, but you might have one or two or three or five. Um, so that includes you no know, constipation, um, urinary issues, mood changes, psychosis, and then importantly, sleep can be impacted with Parkinson's disease. 
So it's definitely something to be aware of and to address with your Parkinson's disease doctor. So why is sleep affected in Parkinson's disease? So the understanding of Parkinson's disease is that there are Lewy bodies, which is a clumping of abnormal protein called alpha synuclein in the brain. And so this image just shows the little uh, alpha synuclein where they clump up together they form this Lewy body, which you can see here on the right, this little pink round thing, that's a Lewy body within a nerve cell. And this can impact how well these nerve cells function and when they don't work properly, this can cause the motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And these Lewy bodies can be found throughout the brain in Parkinson's disease patients, including the areas of the brain that are uh, important in sleep and wakefulness. So there are many different sleep disorders that are associated with Parkinson's disease. And I list a couple here um, that include rapid eye movement or REM sleep behavior disorder, insomnia, both primary and secondary, and we'll talk about this later, sleep fragmentation, restless leg syndrome, and sleep apnea. And to understand what kind of sleep issues a patient might have, often it's hard to tell when you're just talking about someone sleeping at night. There's more nuances that might need something like a sleep study. This is also called a polysomnograph or PSG. Uh, it can be very helpful to understand the uh, special components of how you sleep. And it can be done at a sleep center usually, or sometimes if you have a more straightforward case, you can do it at home with a home sleep monitor. And what the sleep study does is it records specific components of your sleep including your brain waves, how well you oxygenate your blood, uh, how well um, your heart rate is, your breathing, your eye movements, and also your leg movements. And this is the general sleep study setup. So you can see lots of wires. So, and it might vary between the different sleep centers you do your sleep study at. But generally speaking, we'll start from the left. You might have electrodes on your legs and this monitors leg movements because you might kick at night or move at night. And so this helps define the movements you have when you're sleeping. There may be a belt that you put around your waist to monitor your breathing. Uh, there may be electrodes that are put on your head to look at brain activity. You might have a nasal cannula that monitors how well you're having airflow. And then the microphone to record snoring. So you can imagine it can be somewhat tough to sleep at night because it's pretty much not a normal situation. You know, you're in a foreign environment, you're wired up. So I recognize that some people have trouble sleeping at a sleep study. So this can play a role in how good results and how good of information we can gather. But generally speaking, the sleep study can be very helpful for identifying different sleep components that may affect how well you sleep. So let's talk about the stages of sleep. So there's five different stages. Um, the first stage is this drowsiness stage, which is the first five to 10 minutes of sleep. Then you go on to stage two, which is a light sleep that can last about 20 minutes. Then you go into deeper sleep, stage three, where there's moderate sleep, lasts about 10 to 20 minutes. Then even deeper sleep in stage four, which lasts about 30 minutes. And then lastly, stage five, which is the rapid eye movement or REM sleep situation. And then this is just kind of a representation of how you cycle between the different stages throughout your ideally eight hours of sleep at night. And I recognize not everyone sleeps eight hours. Some people do well on six hours and feel rested, but on average, we say eight hours. So you cycle from awake, down to the different stages to stage four, then up to REM, and then kind of cycle back, cycle back, cycle back throughout the night until you wake up in the morning, hopefully rested. So let's first talk about REM sleep behavior disorder because this is a very common feature of Parkinson's disease. So REM again stands for rapid eye movement. 
normally in this period of sleep, your eyes are very active. So they're just going back and forth, back and forth. And so we call this rap rapid eye movement, hence. Um, but typically in this period of sleep, your body is paralyzed and doesn't move, just your eyes move. So in REM sleep behavior disorder or RBD or RBSD, you are actually not paralyzed and then you can act out your dreams. In fact, you're very active acting out your dreams. And this can cause injury, of course, unintentionally to the people around you. So your bed partner might say, oh, he or she was kicking me, um, punching me. Um, and this is, again, you have probably no awareness of this. Um, often we just diagnose by history alone. We might ask the, the caregiver or the bed partner who comes uh, along with you to your visit and they will say, yeah, he's very he or she's very active, kicking around in bed, kicking off the covers. Sometimes we're not exactly sure if it's REM sleep behavior disorder or RBD. For instance, I work with a lot of veterans and they have PTSD. And so it might be helpful to get a sleep study to better determine if the acting out of dreams at night is PTSD or RBD. Again, so your bed partner might describe these following actions, arm flailing, grabbing at things, jumping from the bed, kicking, punching, sitting up, talking, or yelling. And hopefully you can see this video, but this is generally a video of someone having RBD. So hopefully you saw that was sleeping soundly and then sat up from bed and started punching the other side of the bed. And so this is REM sleep behavior disorder. So RBD is a relatively recently recognized disorder. Um, the first major medical paper that published it was 1986. And it's estimated to be present in about 15 to 30% of patients with Parkinson's disease. It is much more common in men than in women. And importantly, it can be part of premotor Parkinson's disease. So these are symptoms, non-motor symptoms that can precede the development of motor symptoms. So before the tremors develop, stiffness, slowness, and posture changes, people might have these early on, maybe 10 years before the actual diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And besides uh, RBD, um, other premotor symptoms may include poor sense of smell, constipation, and depression. So these are often questions we will address and ask uh, in the clinic. About 50 to 70% of patients with RBD may go on to develop Parkinson's disease or related Parkinsonian disorder. So what to do if you have RBD? So options may include modifying the sleep environment. And this unfortunately sometimes means that the bed partner might move into a different bed in the same room or to a different room entirely. Um, other things that we might consider are melatonin. It actually works quite well for RBD. And the doses that we often need to use are higher than what you typically use for sleep. So sometimes 15 to 20 milligrams might need, need to be used to temper the RBD. In patients where melatonin, melatonin is ineffective, we might use clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. It works in the same mindset as alcohol. It definitely calms down the brain. We, we like to use small doses because one, there's more addictive qualities to benzodiazepines and it can worsen sleep apnea, which we'll talk about later. And so for patients who do use clonazepam and have sleep apnea, definitely a CPAP mask should be used. So next up, let's talk about insomnia, which I'm sure a lot of people have, I often have as well myself. 
So there's the primary insomnia and secondary insomnia. So starting with primary insomnia, this is that difficulty falling asleep at the beginning of the night. Then there's secondary insomnia, which is difficulty falling asleep after waking up during the night. There are many causes of insomnia, including as you get older, you have higher risk for insomnia. Parkinson's medications can cause this. If you have restless leg syndrome, which I will talk about later, this can affect your sleep. Sleep apnea, especially if you don't use a CPAP. Nocturia, which means needing to go to the bathroom overnight, which many Parkinson's patients have that difficulty with. Trouble rolling in bed, moving about in bed can contribute to insomnia, depression and anxiety. And definitely if you nap a lot during the day, it can affect how easily you can go to bed at night. So in terms of solutions to deal with insomnia, of course, we start off with improving sleep hygiene, mainly because these are uh, changes that don't cause side effects versus like medications. So importantly, you know, turn off all screens, TV, phone, try and keep those electronics out of the bedroom because the light of the TV and the phone are activating and make it harder for you to fall asleep. And try to make that bedroom only for sleep, nothing else. Keep the area dark as best as possible, especially if light affects your ability to sleep. So sometimes just using like heavier blackout curtains is effective. Or if you just want something more kind of local, you can just put an eye mask on. That can be very helpful. Make sure your bedroom is quiet, um, not too hot, not too cold, good ventilation if you need a fan. Um, optimize your mattress and pillow because you can imagine having an uncomfortable mattress, uncomfortable pillow, you might move around a lot in bed. It's hard to get comfortable. Other lifestyle changes to affect your sleep include uh, try to avoid eating or exercising too close to bedtime because you might just have too much energy after you eat to go to bed. And avoid caffeine, obviously, nicotine, alcohol, too close to bedtime as that can disrupt your sleep. Uh, try and develop a routine before bedtime, whether it's you know, taking a bath or shower, um, getting into bed, maybe reading a very calming book and then going to bed. That can help. Try to go to bed and get up around the same time each day so you have more of a rhythmic cycle, uh, awake and asleep. Um, I didn't write this in, but using like sound machines can be helpful. I use that a lot for my kids and it helps kind of take away all those ambient noises that might keep you up. And if you cannot fall asleep, sometimes it's helpful just to get out of bed, read for like 15 to 20 minutes, but avoid the phone. So don't read on the phone and then try to go back to sleep and then repeat this until you actually can fall asleep. In terms of other solutions for insomnia, uh, sometimes doing cognitive behavioral therapy, like I'm retraining your brain to shut down. Mindfulness can be helpful. Sometimes you are on medications that can affect how well you sleep. For instance, if you're on something like selegenine, uh, which is great for Parkinson's disease, but has an activating component that if you take too late in a day can disrupt your sleep-wake cycles, this might need to be adjusted. If you have depression, this can impact your sleep. So you might need to be on an antidepressant. Um, again, melatonin can be helpful for insomnia to kind of reset your sleep-wake cycles. And this is something you want to take about half an hour before you're ready to go to bed. And then if absolutely needed, can consider sleep medications. And it might be helpful sometimes to actually have a sleep medicine referral to the sleep expert. In terms of medications we use for sleep, uh, I wrote down a couple here. So there's the benzodiazepines like clonazepam, the same one that we use for the REM sleep behavior disorder. This can help you with sleep and insomnia. Uh, sometimes we can use sedating antidepressants uh, like trazodone, mirtazapine. I actually really like mirtazapine because it can often deal with a couple of different things, including mood, sleep and if you have not a great appetite, it helps with appetite as well. And it's pretty well tolerated. Uh, hypnotics like Ambien can be used if necessary. 
For some patients who also have hallucinations or agitation later on in the night, uh, sedating antipsychotics like Seroquel or quetiapine can be helpful. And rarely uh, people might use sedating antihistamines like Benadryl, but of course there's again, side effects in all these classes. So we just have to be very mindful about the pros and cons of, of starting a medication for sleep. Next, let's talk about sleep fragmentation. So these are the brief arousals that occur during a period of sleep. Uh, this can lead to poor sleep quality because you might sleep for eight hours, but if you keep on waking up many times in the middle of the night, it's not good sleep quality. You won't feel rested in the morning. Um, it can lead to decreased restfulness and excessive daytime sleepiness. And the patient might not be aware that he or she is having these arousals because they're half awake during these arousal periods. And it might only really be seen on the sleep study. So this is where a sleep study again can be helpful. And this is what sleep fragmentation looks like. So on the top, you have a normal sleep-wake cycle for eight hours of sleep for a person. So again, you cycle between the different stages, you have periods of REM, but overall, this is pretty standard. A couple of cycles and then boom, you're awake at eight hours later. For someone with sleep fragmentation, you can see it's much more chaotic. You know, you go through a couple stages, don't really get to stage four, the, the heavier sleep, and then kind of bounce back to being awake, 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 awake many times in the middle of night. So you can imagine if this is what your sleep-wake cycle looks like, the one on the bottom, you're probably not feeling very well rested when you wake up the following day. So we're gonna talk about different things that can make your sleep fragmented. And we'll start off with restless leg, ah, restless leg syndrome. Uh, so this is that uncomfortable sensation in your legs and sometimes in your arms with this urge to move. That's important. You feel like you have this urge to move and you feel better after you move. And it's worse during periods of rest or inactivity and worse in the evenings, obviously, when you're trying to go to bed. It's temporarily, again, relieved by movement. So people will tell me, I, after I move, I feel a little bit better. But then I have to keep on moving and moving. And it can be described as crawling sensations, electric, itching, achy sensations in the legs most commonly. Again, it occurs in the evening and night and can prevent or interrupt the sleep. So some patients can have this without having Parkinson's disease. Actually, many of my patients have just restless leg syndrome. And it's not a um, premotor symptom of Parkinson's disease necessarily. Uh, and it can, can, so some people uh, I have are people with neuropathy, so nerve damage in their legs and their hands, and they can have restless legs because of this. Some people have iron deficiencies, and this can cause restless leg syndrome as well. So restless leg syndrome, or RLS, affects between 2 to 10% of people. It can present at any age, and the prevalence does increase as you get older. It's more common in females in general, and it runs in families. So people will give me the history that, oh yeah, my mom had it, my brother had it. And it may be more common in people with Parkinson's disease. In terms of treatment for L RLS, um, so this is not specific to just Parkinson's disease patients. This is the list of potential medications we might use. So we might use the dopamine agonists, which are ropinerol, primapexol. Uh, we might actually put them on carvodopa levodopa, even if they don't have Parkinson's disease, because it can be helpful. Also, we use the medications for neuropathy. So again, that nerve damage in the legs. Uh, so we might use gabapentin, gabapentin and the carbil, which is a longer acting gabapentin. We might use pregabalin or Lyrica is the other name for it. Again, if people have iron deficiency, we might put them on iron supplementation and we might work on improving their sleep hygiene. Like the tips I recommended earlier, uh, trying to have a calming environment before sleeps, a sleep routine before they go to bed. 
There are also medications that can worsen RLS, uh, and that includes antidepressants, especially SSRI, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, there's also the dopamine blocking anti-nausea medications like Reglan or Compazine, and also sedating antihistamines, including those found in non-prescription medications can actually worsen restless leg syndrome. So just be mindful of that, that you might be on medications that worsen it, and those might need to be taken off if your RLS is particularly bothersome. Okay, so next up, we're going to talk about sleep apnea, which is very common in the general population. And I like this uh, comic because most people with sleep apnea aren't aware that they snore until they tell their bed partner tells on them in the clinic visit because it keeps them awake. So sleep apnea. So this is a sleep disorder in which breathing stops and starts through the night. This leads to periods of low oxygenation in the blood and causes frequent awakenings. And Parkinson's disease may be associated with two main sleep apnea types. So there's the central sleep apnea and then the obstructive sleep apnea. So the central sleep apnea is that decreased drive to breathe uh, due to actually changes in the brain, like a brain stem. So that's the connecting part to the brain and the spinal cord, that's called the brain stem. There might be a uh, lesion there or changes there. There's also obstructive sleep apnea, which is where your muscles are just not moving effectively or there's airway blockage to your, th uh, your tongue dropping back into your airway causing obstruction of your airway, causing you to have low oxygenation throughout the night. So again, here shows the two main different kinds of sleep apnea. Again, the central one on the left, which occurs where the brain's area that controls your breathing does not function correctly during sleep. And then there's also, again, obstructive sleep apnea, which there's a blockage of the upper airway, and that restricts your oxygen to your, your brain and your body. So here's just another figure that shows what happens in obstructive sleep apnea. You know, in a normal patient that does not have obstructive sleep apnea, you get good airflow from your nose, from your mouth, um, into your lungs. But with obstructive sleep apnea, there's blockage of it, physical blockage. Either your tongue falls back or you have particular airway structure differences that cause you to be more prone to have a blocked airway. For instance, obesity, as you gain weight, that increases your risk for obstructive sleep apnea. So again, this just shows you what happens when you develop obstructive sleep apnea or OSA. Um, again, on the left, you have good airflow. Uh, when you snore, that's because you're partially blocking that airway. And so that makes that loud snoring sensation that uh, your bed partner might hear. Then again, there's the apnea, which is the fully blocked airway, causing loss of oxygenation throughout your body. And then again, with central sleep apnea, there are changes in your brainstem, which is that connecting part of your nervous system to the brain and to the spinal cord. It's important for breathing and it affects the breathing muscles uh, that surround the rib cage, the diaphragm, and that can impact your, your breaths that you, you have. So for sleep apnea, the common complaints are poor, co uh, poor cognition, poor concentration, low mood, irritability, restless sleep, insomnia. You might say, I wake up with this terrible headache. You have daytime excessive fatigue. And then you might have to wake up multiple times during the night to go to the bathroom. So to formally diagnose sleep apnea, you have to do a sleep study, either if it's at home or in the clinic, kind of depending on how complex your medical issues are. And untreated sleep apnea can raise the risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke, and can cause depression, poor memory, and persistent headache. So when I have concern that a patient has sleep apnea, I very strongly advocate for them to get a sleep study um, and I recognize that the thought of having to use a CPAP can be very daunting, but I, I definitely 
do recommend that they try and pursue a sleep study if possible and pursue ways to improve on their sleep apnea if possible. And so yeah, I get it. It's not a small thing to have to wear a CPAP. And I do know that there's improvement in the technology where the masks are smaller. Some of them only are like fitted over your mouth or your nose. Um, but I, I recognize that fortunately I have a lot of veterans who cannot use a CPAP because one, they have PTSD, they feel claustrophobic with the mask. So I get it that it can be very tough to think about wearing a CPAP mask. So in terms of non-CPAP methods of managing sleep apnea, mm -hmm. so ways to address, this is obstructive sleep apnea in particular, you want to elevate your head of bed so that the structures that tend to block the airway do not fall back into the airway. Or sleep on your side, because again, if you sleep on your back, everything kind of falls back into the airway. On the side, there's less of that issue. You can also try to use an oral appliance um, that kind of keeps your airway open. This is good for OSA, obviously. Uh, weight loss, especially if you're overweight, can help with sleep apnea and decrease alcohol intake can improve your breathing at night. And so it reduces the amount of apneic events. If you do uh, need to use a ventilator of sorts, there's two main kinds. Uh, there's the CPAP, which stands for continuous positive airway pressure. And it's the same pressure that's given both with inhalation and exhalation. If you have a bit more complex of a breathing pattern at night, they might recommend using a BiPAP, which is bi-level positive airway pressure, where there are different pressures between inhalation and exhalation. And this uh, picture just kind of reinforces that there's two different types of non-invasive uh, ventilation. Again, the CPAP is most commonly used on the left. It has the same set pressures for both breathing in and breathing out. On the right uh, is the BiPAP, which has different settings for breathing in and breathing out. And it tends to be used for more complex sleep and breathing disorders. And I also recognize that there seems to be a CPAP shortage right now. I think the Philips had to be recalled. And so there's a huge wait list to get CPAP machines. So if you don't have sleep apnea, but you're concerned, this is the way to get a sense if you have a high risk, a medium risk, or a low risk. It's called the stop bang questionnaire. So I use this all the time for my patients. So I'm gonna kind of stop at this slide for a second. You guys can go through those questions and see how many yeses you have. And on the bottom, if you have zero to two, you have a low risk for sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the middle, three to four, you have an intermediate risk. And then five to eight, you have a high risk. Um, again, the things that give you a point are if you snore, if you're tired during the day, if someone's seen you stop breathing when you're sleeping, if you have high blood, uh, high blood pressures and take medications for it, uh, if you're overweight, if your BMI is over 35, as you get older, you have an increased risk. So over 50, you get a point. If you have a big neck, um, they give you the different circumferences for male and female. And then higher risk in males. So you get an extra point if you happen to be male. So if you don't have time to get all your points in, um, again, you get the PDF so you can go through this and see if you're high risk or low risk or intermediate risk. And let your uh, provider know, either your primary care doctor or your Parkinson's doctor know what you score and if you would be... Um, whether it be recommended that you get a sleep study to further evaluate for sleep apnea. Okay, so lastly, we're gonna talk about you know, specific components of Parkinson's disease and how they impact sleep. Um, so starting with mood. So Parkinson's disease can cause changes in your mood, both depression and anxiety. It's one of those non-motor symptoms. So just kind of remember that iceberg so below the iceberg, one of the changes that can happen are mood changes. And patients might tell me they just can't fall asleep because they're worried about things or they're anxious about things and they can't fall asleep at night. Or if they do fall asleep, they might wake up and then have trouble falling asleep again. So this can be very bothersome for patients. 
So what do we do about this? So we can incorporate both non-medication changes and medication changes. So with lifestyle modifications, we can use exercise. Exercise is wonderful. If you ever hear a Parkinson's talk, usually at some point they will mention exercise because it is so essential to how you feel. Um, and it, it, it definitely impacts sleep. So try and exercise during the day so that you'll be able to relax and sleep better at night. Meditation, mindfulness can be helpful. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful. Talking with a psychologist. Uh, and then if necessary, we can provide medications to help with mood, including the SSRIs, which are these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or the selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Ones I particularly like, again, are like mirtazapine that I talked about earlier, because it can help with sleep and mood and appetite. Um, other ones I might use are like nortriptyline or amitriptyline, um, which can be helpful for sleep as well. And if you have headaches, helpful for that as well and mood. I usually like to try and use medications that help with multiple different things, not just one particular thing. So another Parkinson's disease symptom that can impact sleep are hallucinations. So for instance, seeing or hearing things that are not present. Common hallucinations patients might have are furry animals, either scary or not scary, uh, babies, dead relatives, um, people they know. And patients can wake up to a hallucination and it can make it very hard to fall back asleep again. In terms of what we can do for hallucinations, so it ranges from non-medication management, like reassurance, you know, telling the patient that uh, that that thing is not actually there, the dog or cat's not actually there, or the person's not there. Sometimes just briefly turning on the lights to provide them with that reassurance or focusing their attention onto something else can be helpful. Sometimes the hallucinations are actually due to medications that we give a, a patient with Parkinson's disease. And it might be helpful to either taper off or stop that particular medication. And these include the dopamine agonists, which are again, Repinerol and Premipexol. Some patients might uh, be taking anticholinergics, such as trihexyphenidyl or artane for things like tremors. Unfortunately, those can cause um, hallucinations. So just be mindful of that. Amantadine, which is a flu medication that we use in Parkinson's disease for both motor symptom control and for dyskinesias, which are those wiggly movements, those can sometimes cause hallucinations. The MAOB inhibitors like risagiline and selegiline can impact hallucinations as well. And lastly, COMPT inhibitors, which are such as uh, intacopone or picopone, those are the ones, again, that keep dopamine around longer, or sorry, they keep levodopa around longer. Those can also cause hallucin hallucinations uh, uh, possibly. So, these are just medications to be mindful of that can contribute to hallucinations that might need to be adjusted if the hallucinations are bothersome and affect sleep. Carbidopa levodopa itself can cause hallucinations. So we might need to adjust how we give the carbidopa levodopa, whether it's reducing the dose or trying a different formulation that might lead to less hallucinations that might need to be addressed. Um, and worse comes to worse, sometimes we need to start medications that help with hallucinations like Seroquel or quetiapine, which has the benefit of reducing hallucinations and also helping with sleep. So I do use that in my patients who have bothersome hallucinations and poor sleep. Nuplazid is another medication that is helpful for hallucinations that is FDA approved for Parkinson's disease. So that's another uh, medication that may be considered by your provider. Uh, so the next class of symptoms that can impact sleep for Parkinson's disease patients are the urinary symptoms. And this is quite common. I have lots of discussion with my patients about their need to wake up like three, four times, three, four times in the night to go to the bathroom and how that interrupts your sleep. And the different types of urinary symptoms can include urgency that need to go to the bathroom right away, needing to go to the bathroom frequently, and then again, when you are sleeping, feeling like you have to go wake up, go to the bathroom multiple times at night. 
Um, people also might go to the bathroom, but still feel like they are going to be dribbling a bit. They can't get the urine fully out. And when they do, there's still a bit left that dribbles out. So there, these can all be very problematic for patients, especially at night when they're trying to sleep. So in terms of treatments, so always want to make sure there's not a other cause for the urinary issues. For instance, as we get older, if you're male, you might have enlarged prostate issues. Um, other things that can be helpful are pelvic floor therapy, which is like Kegels, exercises that strengthen the muscles uh, around your bladder. Uh, urinary issues of Parkinson's disease can be treated with medications, but the important thing to recognize is some of these medications can cause cognitive side effects such as oxybutynin. And so I tend to like to avoid those medications. I use Mirabegron, which has less cognitive side effects, but not all patients can get it depending on their insurance. And then worse comes to worse, sometimes people actually get Botox injections into their bladder muscle to relax the bladder muscle. I, have, I don't have any patients who get Botox, but that is definitely of consideration and would be done by the urologist. And then there's lifestyle changes that might be helpful. Uh, just reducing how much fluids you take at the end of the day. So often people say, stop drinking anything after 6 p.m. Of course, it depends on how late you go to bed. Uh, reduce caffeine and alcohol intake, anything that makes you want to pee. Uh, compression stockings, leg elevation can be helpful, especially if there's leg swelling. If you have sleep apnea, use your CPAP because untreated sleep apnea can cause nocturia or peen in the middle of the night. So another incentive, incentive to use a CPAP if you are recommended to use it. Some people are on water pills like furosemide or Lasix, and ideally you want to take those away from bedtime or else, again, you'll be up all night going to the bathroom. And other things that you might want to consider are, of course, having a bedside urinal or commode, something that's nearby so you don't have to walk all the way to the bathroom where you have risk for falls. Um, some people find the reassurance that even if they do pee when they're sleeping, they have briefs on, and so it's not that big of a deal. Ideally, I just don't like it when patients have to rush to the bathroom. It just increases the risk for falls and complications. Some people have condom catheters um, to, to help with um, urination that they can keep in bed, though there is a higher risk for infection on that standpoint. So I don't have any patients on condom catheters, but that is something to consider as well too. And then next up, I'm gonna talk about uh, motor symptoms and how they can impact sleep. So in the beginning stages of Parkinson's disease, most people have pretty solid response to their medications. You, know, you take your medications, you don't feel any fluctuations, your symptoms are fairly well controlled. But as the disease progresses, there's more chance for motor fluctuations, which is you take your medication and it doesn't kick in as well, and you either are off you don't feel like you're adequately medicated or you're very on, have dyskinesias, those wiggly movements. And there's a lot less predictability that is associated with taking your medications. This can definitely impact sleep as disease progresses, especially if you're lying in bed, your tremor acts up or your stiffness acts up, you just can't fall asleep, you can't get comfortable. So when a patient tells me that they, they feel stiff or tremulous or uncomfortable in bed, and I think it's related to the motor symptoms of their Parkinson's disease, I might change their carbidopa-levodopa regimen a bit. Um, for patients who are only on immediate release during the day, I might add a control release, longer acting carbidopa-levodopa at bedtime so that they have some levodopa in their system to kind of tie them over till the morning. So this is often the 5200 uh, tablet that I might use. In patients with a bit more progressed Parkinson's disease, um, they might benefit from the Riteri, which is the capsule that has both the immediate and the long acting um, carbidopa levodopa. It, it sounds wonderful. It doesn't work quite as effectively as it is, it, as it is advertised, but it can be helpful for patients um, who have a lot more motor fluctuation issues. 
Some people have the duopa, which is the intestinal gel that gets put into the pump that is in the, uh, put into your gut through a tube. That can help a bit with the motor fluctuations. Um, but no, at night, you actually don't use the gel. You actually take capsules right before bedtime. Yeah, I know I can go all around, way around the building. And I'm sorry, I'm in clinic, and so there might be some ambient noise outside. So if you can't hear me, just speak up. Let me know. I'm trying to speak as loud as clear as, poss as possible. Um, so I also have to weigh in the Parkinson's medications that a patient takes and see if those are actually the ones that are impacting sleep. So for some patients, they actually get drowsy on the carvedopa levodopa. So I might have to put them on a different formulation to reduce drowsiness. For instance, some people tell me the immediate release carvedopa levodopa, the 25100 causes drowsiness after they take it. And they might have less of this when they take the controlled release, a slower acting one, because it gives them a little bit less of a punch of levodopa and less risk for side effects. For some patients, um, they are on something like donepazole for their thinking, and this can cause vivid dreams or nightmares that affect their sleep. So that's something to keep in mind if it's helpful or causing more problems. Uh, dopamine agonists like rapinarol or primapexol can cause sleep attacks. So this is like suddenly they, they fall asleep without a warning. And if they do this many times during the day, it can impact their sleep-wake cycle and they have trouble going to bed at night. So I always look at the patient's medications and make sure that I'm not contributing to the sleep issues. Uh, I think I only have like two more slides. Uh, so fatigue and Parkinson's, this is not an uncommon um, uh, symptom that people will bring up to me. And it could be caused by many different things, maybe more than one of these that I show on the slide. So poor sleep, a sedentary lifestyle, so really not doing much during the day, kind of just sitting in a chair watching TV that can make you just feel further fatigued and more deconditioned. It could be a medication side effect, like I mentioned before, or it could be from another medical issue. Some people have thyroid imbalance or anemia or heart issues that can impact how fatigued they feel. Low vitamin D, especially up here in the Pacific Northwest, can contribute to fatigue. And so definitely take your vitamin D supplements up here in Seattle uh, and Portland um, and Canada, actually. Uh, depression can impact fatigue. Uh, having excessive movements during the day, if you're one who tremors a lot or has lots of dyskinesias, you're actively moving all that period of time, whether you want to or not, and that can make you feel tired. And then it's a part of, it's a potential part of Parkinson's disease. There's neurodegeneration in the area of the brainstem that's responsible for maintaining wakefulness. And so that can make you feel fatigued throughout the day. And then lastly, excessive daytime sleepiness. So this is defined as that inability to maintain wakefulness during the waking day. And this excessive daytime sleepiness can increase um, as Parkinson's advances. Again, just be mindful, it can be related to medication. So something to be aware of, uh, you know, as people add more medications to your regimen. So how do we improve fatigue? How do we improve daytime wakefulness? So I said again, exercise is something always or should always be mentioned in the Parkinson's disease talk. And so this is the second time I'm talking about it because it is so important. So encourage daily exercise. It helps you have that boost of energy and helps you with the sleep at the end of the day. Um, so encourage daytime exercise, activities, having a schedule of things to do that will improve your wakefulness, improve your fatigue, hopefully. Um, again, optimize sleep, um, addressing those different sleep issues that may occur that I talked about earlier in this talk. Address depression if you're depressed with the antidepressants or with different uh, depressive uh, treatments, whether it's um, speaking with a therapist, using light therapy, et cetera, exercise, et cetera. Again, looking through the medication list that you're on and make sure that you're not on too many sedating medications that affect your wakefulness during the day. And in some patients, I will actually use stimulating medications. I didn't actually write one of them up here. I should have one is selegiline, which is one of the MAOB inhibitors. 
um, it has a breakdown product that is a amphetamine. So it gives you that burst of energy. And I like to use it for my Parkinson's patients to impact their motor symptoms and also improve their, uh, their wakefulness during the day. Just be, be mindful if you're on selegenine, try and take those two doses. Often it's dose five milligrams twice a day. I would always try and take those two doses by, by noon or at one or two at the latest. Because if you take it late in the day, it might impact how well you can go to bed. Um, besides that, some patients I put on modafinil or methylphenidate, and it helps give you that boost of energy they need to do things during the day. And caffeine itself can be very helpful. That's what I use today to um, perk me up from my poor sleep last night. So it's a-okay to drink a coffee. Just don't drink it at the end of the day or else it might keep you up because you might need to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So you don't want to do that. Um, I think that is it for my talk. I know I gave you a lot of information, but again, all of this will be on the slides that I'll give you. Um, and if you have further questions, I'm happy to address them. But I thought this cartoon was actually quite funny because it's actually very true. Um, the times you don't want to sleep, you end up falling asleep or feeling tired. And when you're sleeping at night, that's just when you just can't seem to shut that brain down. So hopefully this talk provided you with some hints and tips to improve your sleep and questions to address with your primary care provider. Um, that was very informative. A lot of, um, a good number of questions have come in. You gave us a lot of information. Again, we will be sharing this with you. Um, so a couple of questions that have come in. One that came in beforehand, um, and actually a couple of questions came in related mm -hmm. to melatonin use. Yeah. And so I wanted to just ask kind of um, two questions about that. Are there yeah. any concerns with prolonged use of melatonin and its effect on Cinemed or other PD meds? And then the, the second part of that, is it helpful in preventing dreams from being more intense or does it just help you sleep? Uh, so yeah, so melatonin we use very commonly in REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, so there's no interactions with carbidopa levodopa. Uh, the good thing about carbidopa levodopa in general is there's actually not too many interactions with other medications. So it makes it easy to use. It's just the protein component that I think is trickier to maneuver when you're trying to take it away from food. But melatonin and coverage of levodopa are fine to take together. In fact, I have a lot of patients who take melatonin and also a longer acting coverage of levodopa at bedtime to help with kind of relaxing their bodies and helping them have less REM sleep behavior disorder. So the melatonin reduces that REM sleep behavior disorder, the acting out of dreams. So if a patient tells me, or probably more the patient's partner tells me that they're kind of punching around, kicking, yelling, that's when I'll say, you should try some melatonin and see how it goes. I usually start off with a low dose. Um, so it's often in like a three or five milligram gummy or capsule or whatnot. I like the gummies um, because they taste good. Um, <laughs> but generally speaking, yeah, I'd start off with a low dose and go up as needed. On average, I would say patients are on like nine to 12 for my patients, um, for the ones who actually take melatonin. And it's very well tolerated. There's no long-term side effects of the melatonin, which is why I like to use it over the clonazepam, which is that benzodiazepine. I usually hold off on using that unless a patient has tried a lot of melatonin and tells me it's not effective. Then I will utilize the clonazepam, but always a small dose. I usually use at most like 0.5 milligrams to one milligram at bedtime. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yep. And as far as the REM behavior disorder stuff, mm -hmm. um, how, well, two things related. Should you wake yep. a person up who is actively doing that? And I guess, well, I'll answer that one and then I'll move on to the next question. Um, generally speaking, I don't have patients um, get woken up for it. Just kind of let them finish acting out their dreams um, and continue their sleeping. Because I think waking them up also, then they have more trouble falling back asleep. Mm -hmm. And they're actually most of the time not awake during the REM sleep behavior. They're totally unaware that they do that. I get this information from their bed partner. Um, mm -hmm. So I just say, leave, leave them be and protect yourself, importantly. To, yeah, to not and get... one of the questions was, yeah. um, how often mm -hmm. is the sleep partner in real danger when in this REM behavior disorder? 
I guess it probably um, depends on what their dream is. <laughs> exactly. I would um, so, say, yeah, and I would just say in general, like, just talk, to, if you have any sleep concerns, always bring it up to your Parkinson's disease doctor because they will find the ways hopefully to improve your sleep because it's very essential for quality of life. Absolutely. Good last words. So don't let your sleep issues be a secret. Bring it up with your physician because there are things that you can do about it. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Dr. Kimi Sue, thank you so much for all of this fantastic information. And we hope to see you again at another Take Control program or another program that we put on either virtual or at some point we might do something in person. So stay tuned to your APDA news you can use and to our website for any information about upcoming programs and services. We are always just an email and a phone call away. If you enjoy these programs and are in a financial position to make a donation to our organization so we can continue doing this good work, then uh, please feel free to make a donation. It does support all the services that we provide to the Parkinson's community. So with that, I will say farewell for now. I hope you all have a wonderful week and we hope to see you again. Thank you so very much and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.